Hi there, this is the Athletic FC podcast weekend preview and it is match day 37. I'm Adam Leventhal and with me to look ahead to the weekend, this penultimate weekend of the Premier League season is Mr. Tim Spears. How are you, Tim? What's up, buddy? How you doing? I'm very, very well indeed. Um, I'm looking forward to a weekend full of twists and turns Mm. at both the top and the bottom. It's going to happen again, isn't it? We're going to get our twists and turns. It's not predictable the remainder of this season, is it? Last week was really underwhelming, wasn't it? Mm, It was a bit. I've got a feeling this one might be the same. Do you think John McKenzie is here as well? Tim Spears thinks it's just going to go with form and we're not going to have any twists and turns. What's the feeling in your water? Yeah, I think I feel that way as well. Oh, sorry. Damn you, but, John. you know, it is, I think it is very much coin toss territory now at the top. I think it will, you know, if any, if either of the two teams now drops any points, that's it. The other, t- the other team wins. Mm. Um, so, uh, yeah, it doesn't look like that's going to happen, but. Anything can happen. Is it a coin toss or do Man City have a double-sided coin and they're just going to win? Okay, maybe it's a three-sided dice and they've got two of the numbers or something, but yeah. They're in control. Very much so. Well, we shall see. Um, Let's run through the fixture formation for this penultimate Premier League weekend. Uh, It is an 8-1-1-er and we start on Saturday lunchtime. Reigning champions, Manchester City, looking to go above Arsenal for at least a day when they go to Craven Cottage to play Fulham have been flying kites on their training ground. We'll get into that a little bit later on. It's 6, 3 p.m. on Saturday. Everton, Sheffield United, West Ham against Luton, Bournemouth, Brentford, Wolves, Palace, Spurs against Burnley and Newcastle against Brighton. Then 5.30 on Saturday, Nottingham Forest hosting Chelsea. And then on to Sunday, just the one fixture, and it is a big one, 430 Manchester United hosting Arsenal at Old Trafford, knowing a win against their old rivals could effectively end Mikel Arteta's side title bid. And then finally on Monday, it is Aston Villa against Liverpool at Villa Park. But we are going to start at Old Trafford. Both Arsenal and City won last weekend, as we mentioned, meaning the gap between the two sides is still just a point. Arsenal have two to play. Manchester United away this weekend. And then Everton at home on the final day. City have three to play against Fulham away, Spurs away, and then West Ham at home. And interestingly, do you want some stats on Manchester United against Arsenal? Because I think it is worth bearing this in mind because United like playing Arsenal at home. They've lost just one of their last 16 Premier League home games against Arsenal. They've won 10, drawn five, uh, going down 1-0 in November 2020. But then you think about the current Manchester United side. They're basically an open book. Um, What what do we make of this Manchester United side, having seen what they did or didn't do, or whatever whatever was going on at Crystal Palace? They were awful, weren't they? Mm, That's the thing. So I was kind of thinking, you know, United do tend to raise their game against better teams. They've unbeaten against Liverpool in three this season. You know, a few weeks ago, we were saying they were going to get tanked by City and they sort of took them to the 80th minute, one all, but... Yeah, they were they were bedraggled the other day and they don't have much to play for and they've got the worst injury record in the league at the moment. Mm. We'll see if that eases this this weekend. Yeah, do we know if there's is anyone going to be back? Because, I mean, you look at that back four that they played um, at oh Crystal goodness, Palace. Yeah. Wan-Bissaka, Johnny Evans, Casemiro, who we'll talk about a little bit more in a moment, and Dallow. Uh, is anyone going to be back? I think Martinez, Shaw, Varane and Lindelof are all sort of closing in. Yeah. But you wouldn't want to chuck... Chuck them in after a couple of days training, especially Lissandra Martinez and Luke Shaw. Well, you wouldn't want to chuck, while. as in Eric Ten Hag, you wouldn't want to chuck them in. But also, they'd probably be thinking, "I don't want to go in there." It's different. It's difficult, isn't it? Because you you take some of those players out, plop them into different games or different moments in their career, including the Arsenal ones, including these Manchester United players like Casemiro. Brilliant, world beaters. But on 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 that day at Selhurst Park, it was it was really wrong. Um, in terms of Casemiro. I don't really know where I sit on this because I find it quite sort of, it's quite personal. It's quite uncomfortable. And Jamie Carragher basically saying, look, he he needs to stop now, basically, because he's getting found out. He's he's effectively looking like a pub player. Um, where do you stand on it? Do you think it's it's other pros places to do that? Or or maybe it's it's a helpful thing that, that Jamie Carragher is doing, saying, look, just you need to you need to back off now, pal. It's a tricky one, isn't it? Because... I mean, 
in many respects, like Casemiro is not too old to be involved in those conversations yet. I don't think he's younger than Kevin De Bruyne, I believe. Um, so what we've seen is really like a physical drop off. Mm. I remember we put out a piece earlier in the season about what, what happens when a player's legs go. Yeah, that seems to have happened with Casemiro, and against the background of, as you were saying before, the fact that Man United are completely open now in central midfield areas which just allows teams to run through them so was able to get away with it a bit more last season but seems to have lost that ability to do that now which which compounds everything right so um certainly in this Manchester United team it looks like he's 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 finished the question is whether or not as you said before if you put him in a different team would he offer something to uh to that to that team I just I can't see anyone in in, in sort of a, in the, elite, the elite level wanting to do that right now which I guess is why Carragher was prompted to say. But players can end up in the condition that they are mentally, physically, because of the environment that they're in. And that seems to, you know, going from, as I mentioned before, being in a well-beating environment at at Real Madrid and now being at Manchester United, he was great in his first season, but now it's just nothing, nothing seems to fit. Yeah, he was playing at centre-back, which I feel is getting ignored a bit. Yeah, exactly. How many games he played at centre-back in his career? Yeah. Alongside Johnny Evans. Yeah. Um, with no protection from midfield and not being helped at all. This, yeah, some pundits are going, it's like they're all trying to outdo each other at the moment. You had Jamie Redknapp called him Soccer Aid the other week, mm. which I, to be honest, I had a little chuckle at the time. I thought it was quite a good line. Mm. But really, and, and then Roy Keane calling Haaland League Two, it's all a bit, that's mm. the way the discourse is sort yeah. of going, really. I thought I thought Carragher was, was too harsh, telling him to basically retire. He's 32. Um, but yeah, he's, he's not playing well, but he's not helped by those around him. He's not helped by his manager, who leaves this chasm between defence and attack. Oh. And um, and then but then on the flip side, you know, he'll be okay. He's earning 350 grand a week. He's in the middle of a four-year contract. That's 18 million a year. Yeah, but as we know, look, however much you're earning, if you're being panned and it's actually getting into your head and people I, are I having a go it, at you personally, it doesn't matter how much money you've got, does it? It's a fair, very fair point. I think he'll rise above it. I don't think he'll get embroiled in the discourse at all. Yeah. Do you think that they would get a better result if they had a different manager in charge for that game? Or is it just immaterial because they're playing against City and it would probably just be like when they played against Watford and it would be 6-0? Getting rid of Mourinho, I guess, that things that had become problematic in the dressing room, etc. I don't think there's any indication really that's happening at Manchester United. So the big question is whether or not if you brought someone in, they would be able to have an impact within the short space of time from a tactical point of view to turn things around. Um, and I'm guessing... But do they need a better vibes, man? Uh, I mean, who who are you proposing? Well, Pete, I heard proposed on on the radio, um, bringing Ole Gunnar Solskjaer back just for the just for the just for the sort of the fun time vibes and yeah. connecting with the sort of leg- legacy. Have him out at the end of the season, then just so come just in for one, one just, game. Just give it give it Ole dumb? until the end of the is game. That a done thing. <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> but I've I've sort of heard it suggested that maybe they just need another, just another guy. St- give it to Steve McLaren for you know, just get his get Eric Ten Hag's voice out of the equation. I I, I don't know. I'm just I'm just it, it tabling seems, it. It seems odd to me because it it almost feels as though there's not like, there's like a a non-zero percent chance that Eric Ten Hag is still at the job at the beginning of next season, right? Yeah, which I don't. What's going on behind the scenes for that? So to if be he the wins case? the FA Cup final. That doesn't change anything, does it? I mean, he won't. I mean, he won't. No, it's hard to it's hard to say, right? Because it is such a hypothetical. Like, it's it's hard to see them winning the game, and it's also hard to understand what what's happening behind the scenes because of the takeover and, and you know it's it's always unclear as to how a, a, a new owner is gonna is gonna deal with the managerial situation, right? Because it always feels as though an ownership group should bring in their own person, but it feels that that. that Ineos, Jim Ratcliffe, for whatever reason, they've stuck with him to this point. Why would they not have sacked him earlier in the season if, if they were going to get rid of him now? So it feels as though they've hung on to him for some reason. So why would they suddenly because decide now? For Gareth. Well, yeah, that's the thing, isn't it? They've got some good players. They've like, got some talent. They've got plenty of talent. It's just they don't have a deep enough squad to be competitive, right? Sancho, problems with him. Anthony, problems with him. There were problems with Ronaldo last season. Uh, Garnacho recently. Uh, Rashford, obviously Greenwood, lots of problems there. And Bruno Fernandes is the captain to sort of bring this all together. And you, you got rid of Maguire as the captain. There's this a horrible dressing room. It feels like it's been going back years, not not just the last couple. Mm. It's going to take a big clear out. Good luck to the next guy, really. Yeah, and we'll see who it, who it ends up being. It's it's quite a job. Um, 
and it was discussed that maybe Gareth Southgate would be a good guy because it's it's less a tactical thing and it's more a, a mood thing, an environment thing, a, a detoxification role, which he's he's done with England. That's a backhanded compliment, it's, isn't it? But it's an interesting... <laughs> it's all right, Gareth, don't you have to worry about the tactics. <laughs> it's, That's it's, not your it's thing, It's an interesting is it? thing, isn't it, right? Because if he comes in, even if he sorts out a lot of the problems in the dressing room and around the club, if they're not winning games, like... People will still have yeah. an issue with that, right? So exactly. It's you, you sort of need to get the combination of both, right? And it's pretty hard to do that because it feels like tactical managers always are sort of held up as often being like idealistic and difficult to work with, and then the guys who are really, you know, affable and and get everyone feeling positive about the club tend to not be as good tactically. So it's a, it's a definitely a tricky one. Let's talk about someone who is seemingly has the combination of both. At the moment. Affable and technical. Yeah, I think so. It's not everyone's cup of tea, Mikel Arteta, but you know, he's, he seems to be sort of spinning both plates pretty successfully at the moment. Um, in the reverse fixture, uh, when they played at the Emirates, Declan Rice was the, the hero. He scored the decisive goal in stoppage time in a 3-1 win at the Emirates. Um, his former manager, David Moyes, called Rice the best midfield player in the country. I suppose... It, the problem with that statement is it's not defined enough. No, and he's... Is he the he best has, defensive midfielder in the country? Uh, probably this season. But, but he likes to go box to box. Rodri's quite good. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But Moyes is, Moyes is a bit biased, isn't he? Well, it helps his cause, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. Well, There's always an angle. Well, that was where it was raised, right? It was like, yeah. why have you been not been... Exactly. Why have yeah, you just why... lost 5-0 to Chelsea? Yeah. Why have you conceded more goals this season than you, in your entire managerial career? And he talked about Declan Rice. Yeah. So we shouldn't... Yeah, I wouldn't give it too much credence, really. But he's done. He's had a fantastic season. That's what we're getting at, right? Yes. Let's talk about Arsenal as a whole. Then, <laughs> if we're not really going to get stuck into Declan Rice, um, how do we how do we view this season for for Arsenal? If if it still goes to plan for for Manchester City, it's still a, a step forward. We don't we don't worry about it. it. It's just this is just good. They're just up against a better side, a better project. Yeah. I, I, yeah, obviously it's been an improvement. They, they're better this season than they were last season. Um, but I think the, the the worrying things maybe that, that Arsenal will consider is that City have relatively been off the pace this season. And so the question is, you know, do City step up and get to that sort of level of perfection that they had in the past where, you know, you had to put up over 95 points to, to have a chance of winning the title. And if that is the case, if City do progress towards the mean, I don't know how you term that otherwise but um then you know it could be the case that arsenal won't be able to challenge them next season without making changes as well so yeah i think it's it's a step forward but still they still not reach that point i think where if city do reach the the level that we expect of them they'll be you know battling with them to the extent that they have this season so but yeah it's been a really impressive season from arsenal like um in, t in terms of the, the development as well, tactically, because I didn't think Arsenal would challenge this season because they were making such a big switch from what they did last season to this season. But it seems to have gone pretty well. They've, they've, they, I think they got a little bit lucky with variants at the beginning of the season. They won a few games that maybe they shouldn't have won. Um, but that gave them bedrock then to, to slowly grind. And, and now they picked up momentum and they're looking, yeah, they're looking like the team to beat in the Premier League right now. But um, yeah, like I say, the question is whether or not City are going to you know, make a few just signings in the summer and Pep will find a new system and then next season we'll be like, oh, here, we, here we go. If you were to change one thing, add it, take it away, whatever, at Arsenal ahead of next season, considering we are taking it as read that they're not going to win the title this season, which isn't guaranteed. Both of our producers in the, in the, in the uh, gallery there staring me with devilish eyes saying, how dare you? We're waiting for the twist in the title race. It's going to happen. Arsenal are going to win the title. Um, but most other people don't view it that way. Um, what would you do to change Arsenal into title winners next season? Uh, they probably need another regular goal scorer. Mm -hmm. We'll who would who would you while. put in there? Oh, I don't know. Come I, on, I hate these questions. Oh, Why? Because I don't know. I don't know. There's well, well, come on. Dozens of dozens of suitable players around Europe. Who would you, if you could pick a well-known striker? That you that would be affordable, and yeah. would make a difference. Who would you pick? Uh, depends what you mean by affordable, because they spent 100 million on Declan Rice last summer. Are they, mm. are they prepared to do that again? Yes, they are. Yes, they are. Yeah, it's affordable. Uh, I'd go and get Ollie Watkins any day of the week. Really. Ollie Watkins. He'd fit in there front three mm. really nicely. Okay. Um, 
But what's interesting about Arsenal and why I'm very confident for their future is that their squad is so young and they yeah. have improved this year without necessarily improving their first 11 too much with mm -hmm. signings. Uh, Timber was supposed to come in and obviously been injured all season. He'll be like a new signing for sure next season. But you look at, you look at the ages of their players. Saliba, 23. White, 26. Gabriel, 26. Rice, 25. Odegaard, 25. Habits, 24. Saka, 22. Martinelli, 22. That's eight players all coming into their prime. It's amazing how you can do that off the top of your head as well. <laughs> Brilliant. So, um, do you worry about the fact that, yes, so they've got all of these young players, but like Bakaya Saka has played as many minutes as like Wayne Rooney had by the age of whatever, I don't know. The, you know, the, the things that people... Oh, burnout least, boy. He he loves burnout. I mean, he, he won't get past 30, but he's all yeah. right for now. Yeah, yeah. Sure, no, of yeah. course. But like, do you think that, again, like great teams like this tend to have a cycle as well? They've been out of possession heavy this season. Like we've seen this season, their high press having to drop off towards the end of the season. Do you worry that, like, that the that we'll see the same kind of thing going forward with Arsenal that they won't get as much out of their squad as they have done because you know they've made yeah that is a good point. I mean, they rely on their core more than any other title yeah. contenders from this season. Liverpool had the strongest sort of twenty-two, I think, and and Pep can always the, rotate four or five. Per minutes and, in the Premier League, I think City have got like two players in the top 50. I think Arsenal have got something like six or seven players in the yeah. top. So, and, and this is one of the things with Pep, right? The, the long, part of the longevity comes from the fact that he's so good at rotation and it, for whatever reason, it seems as though Arteta hasn't been able to do that. And we're, like every season, they've dropped off at the end of the season a little bit, right? We saw it last season in the title race, we saw it the season before in the Champions League race. So I do think there's questions about how well they... They, they structure the the sort of physical aspect of, of, of squad management. So, I don't know. They, they look pretty strong to me, mm. stronger than they did a year ago. Yeah. I, I guess the, the Champions League is kind of interesting as well from that perspective as well, right? Because I feel as though, and it's some, not something I've really talked about, but like the Premier League sides, everyone made a big thing of the Premier League sides dropping out early, but the Premier League is now such a competitive league that you can't really afford to sort of rest players in. A big part of this, I do think, comes down to the fact that now at the very top, it's so brutal that... That you know we're we're seeing the Premier League sides disadvantaged in Europe because because by the time the the season comes around the, the the sort of crunch time of the European competitions, a lot of the the teams are just sort of on their feet um, and out on their feet. Yeah, you're subscribing to the Jurgen Klopp sort of burnout view. I'm not sure about it. You know, I was looking at it the other day and it, it broke down. Is it John McGinn's sort of amount of games that he's played and played every four days and stuff? He's all right. It's all right. But then if you take into account like PSG, for example, they were able to take breaks before both of their semi-final games, right? Well, I was going to say, Sunday's the ultimate test what John's talking about because, you know, United are bedraggled at the moment. But if that crowd gets behind them, we know they play back and forth very quickly. They're not going to get behind them though, are they? <laughs> are, uh, Arsenal at home. Yeah, maybe. Come on, a chance to deprive them of the title, uh, even though they give it to City. I, no, come on, they will. They'll get. They will. But, and, and don't forget the the Man United game against Liverpool, where they they literally scored that kind of thing. Ridiculous yeah. chances. Yeah. They were battered the whole game. They still and that's what happens, right? Man United have the players to be able to do that. Yeah. You only need to have two good moments to like score two goals. Yeah, they'll try and make it up and down, end to end, Garnacho stretching the play, that kind of thing. It'll be what if they one. play the same way as they did against Crystal Palace? How many goals will they concede against? Arsenal. They will get absolutely turned over. They yeah. will get. But they won't, as we know. They won't. They won't because what comes after a, an absolute capitulation? When you've got Arsenal at home for your last home game of the season, get compact. Let's get organised. You'll be fine. Let's get a score prediction. I think Arsenal will win two one. I think it's either going to be like a complete turning over, like four nil, five nil, embarrassment, or it will be. I can't believe that they weathered the storm, scored a goal and won from Man United. So, yeah, I think it's like a big Arsenal win or like a, just an incredible Man United. How on earth have they won? Let's talk about Manchester City. They're taking on Fulham this weekend. And um, we obviously thought maybe City might slip up. But that, that didn't happen. Um, maybe the the sort of the the title race might take a twist with them losing against Fulham this weekend. No, and then, not. And then you it. see no. you see the Fulham players flying kites well, at the right, training yeah. ground. It's Look, I mean, they might have been doing it after training, even if they were doing it. As, it doesn't no, really, it players, doesn't really they matter. They simply but shouldn't have fun, right? <laughs> yeah, this exactly. Point in the no fun. You can't be seen to having fun at this point of the it's season. It's a nice day. Why not fly a kite? Yeah. Relax. Chill no, out. They should, be, they should have been thinking the whole time yeah. about the upcoming fixture. They should have been training. They should have just been running, running yeah, around, right? Running around. There's no other way they could possibly enjoy themselves with such a serious thing on. But that line. said, is the is the sort of is that a complete misrepresentation, or do you think that that's almost like 
it would that would only <laughs> crop up at the end of the season. It's, I mean, it's the sort of the summer months, end of the season, you're safe. You do sort of tend to sort of mess about well, a little bit more. Well, you wouldn't do it in the winter, would you, flying kites? <laughs> Not what, no. Unless you really like kites. Unless you really, yeah. really like A real it. fan. Yeah, it's a very much a snapshot of their week. We, yes. We must say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, they've been bit, flying a kite all week. All week. week. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we've just been talking about toxic dressing rooms. Surely, like this is a good example mm, of like team bonding. Team bonding. Team the players. They weren't enjoying. all doing it though, were they? <laughs> <laughs> You're saying there's cliques, the kite flying clique and the non kite flying clique. But I think you know it's it's you, those things are important too. You, you know, the, good chemistry on the field has to start with good chemistry off the field. Um, and as long as they are being diligent in their training, I think there's yes. no problem with them having fun out there. Yes, you were slightly critical of uh, of Erling Haaland. So, I mean, yeah, he had gone into and last he, week he scoring then scored, two. How many did two? he score? Two penalties he scored. Oh, and, they don't uh, count. Uh, Craig, Dor easy. Craig Dawson wasn't playing. We've sort of seen City just clicking into gear. Same, same usual story that they don't. They're not showing any signs of worry, are they? Yeah, I think the, early in the season, the big concern with them was that they were actually dropping off a little bit defensively. Yeah. and I think what we've started seeing since the last few weeks or so is that they start they're starting to look a bit more ominous in terms of like they're not giving up as many big chances and um yeah i think you, just, you you get to that point you're like maybe they are just, just going to roll to the end of the season now but they've, they've looked pretty pretty ominous for two or three weeks now but before that there's been games where they've just looked like they couldn't buy a, a, a win and it's um it's, it's sort of a, been an odd season as i said before for city and insofar as like some games they just ease through it and then other games it just looks like there was a game against Villa where they what, took two shots and it was in the same sequence and it was in the 20th minute or something and that was it. That was all they did. And, and we, they've since played Villa again, right? And is that right? And look, looked pretty confident. I can't remember what the score was. But yeah, yeah, they beat my home recently. So. Yeah. How many goals Manchester City are going to score against Fulham? What's Four. the score? 4-0. 4-0? Yeah. 0-4. 3-0. 3-0. I okay. From the top to the bottom. So the relegation battle... Um, it's just about, <laughs> it's just about still alive. Um, yeah, Forest were unsuccessful in their appeal against their four-point deduction. So that sort of kept it, you know, a little bit more interesting. Uh, they're 17th on 29 points, then it's Luton, 18th with 26 points, and Burnley 19th with 24 points. Burnley really let me down, didn't they? Um, Forest are playing Chelsea at the City Ground. 5.30 Saturday. Realistically, they know that one win will secure them um, their safety, taking goal difference into account. They have minus 18. It's not great, but Luton's is minus 29. So it's effectively an extra point. Um, final home game of the season for Nottingham Forest. Mm -hmm. They've got a chance of, of getting their result against Chelsea, but Chelsea are playing well. They have. It's, it's the, probably the worst time of the season to play Chelsea. Mm. Uh, I would say Forest need one point to stay up. Yeah, I uh, I can see Luton getting a maximum of four points from their final two games, which would mean that Forest would only need one more to stay up on goal difference. Uh, Luton have got West Ham away, which is a funny game now because Moyes is on his way. He's put a bit more edge on it, isn't it? Uh, it's, you know? Yeah, it'd be difficult to know which way it goes. And then they've got Fulham at home on the last day, uh, who are flying kites. So <laughs> you can kind of see a, a scenario where Luton get a point at West Ham. And there are boos, <laughs> Moise is booed off. And then they can beat an on-beached Fulham on the last day. Um, and Forest, yeah, I've got Burnley Chelsea. Got, and Burnley then, got Forest on and then the last Burnley day, right? So day. that's a, yeah. a six-point swing, potentially. <laughs> they're starting to play all right. <laughs> yes. They are, aren't they? Yeah, they're, they're very good against an awful West Ham team. Uh, someone was here, um, Matt Davis-Adams, who commentates on the club, was basically mm -hmm. saying it's the worst centre-back partnership he's seen in some time for West Ham. Was it Ogbonna and Zuma, maybe? Um, yeah, I guess an identity is forming. Um, they've had to drop one of their £100 million players in Enzo Fernandez for that to happen, uh, which seems to have released Caicedo a bit, which in turn has released Gallagher. They've got this funny thing where Kukure is now moving into midfield. So, yeah, he's having time to work with a consistent starting eleven. And it's, yeah, it's bearing fruit, as it should do. It's long overdue. Should he stay next season? Yeah, it's a, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Because the, the question with Chelsea is, I mean, they were so bad for most of the season that they obviously couldn't keep up at that rate. They've got better now. The question is, what level of better are they? Are they going to be, are they going to be able to just turn over mid-table sides but not compete against the, the teams in the top four? Um and it's, you know, it's, it's almost like this is the worst thing that can happen for, for the decision makers at the club, for them to have a couple of big score wins 
um, just coming towards the end of the season because they're now going to have to weigh up, okay, there is improvement here, but is it enough improvement um, to justify, you know, giving them a, a, a summer window to spend money in? Um, and and are we going to be in a situation where, you know, two months into next season, we're like, oh, probably should have got a new manager and we've effectively wasted half a season here. So really tr tricky decision for, for, for them. But, I, you know... One of the things we love from Chelsea is they've just ploughed through managers recently, and it had, you know, changing a manager hasn't worked. They've probably got to a point now where it can't be the worst thing in the world to take the risk and, and give him next season and see what happens. So, um, I, I still think there are issues with him. I think the, the 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 modern game has evolved in ways that he hasn't really caught up with yet. Maybe he will. Um, I think particularly defensively, but they've got a good enough team to be able to you know ride the as you said ride the way that they're currently on and, and fix those problems as they go, fix the plane as they're, as they're flying. And um, yeah, if it doesn't work, then new manager the following season. But um, yeah, so I, I don't envy the decision makers at Chelsea because it is a tricky one to, to sort of navigate. I think ditto read the squad, right? Do they go and spend another stupid amount of money this summer or do they stick with this very young team? It's the youngest in the league, I think, in terms of the squad. You know, you look at Mudrick and Palmer and Madweke and Jackson finally getting a run and, and, and working out combinations and getting used to each other and scoring goals. So do they stick with that or do they say, well, this hasn't been rubbish, the players aren't good enough and go spend and spend a, a lot more money? And then you I don't think like, they can, um, though, can they? Well, but then you look at like Gallagher and Chalabar have really come to the fore in recent weeks. And yet they're the two most vulnerable to be sold because of PSR. Yeah. It's like, yeah. So it's an interesting summer on the playing front as well. West Ham against Luton. Obviously, we mentioned it from a sort of a Luton perspective. There's now a little bit more edge uh, on the game because David Moyes is going to hopefully, from his point of view, being given a, you know, a nice farewell from the West Ham fans. Um, they're switching to uh, Julian Lopetegui. Right. One other issue I wanted to talk about just before we go, Tottenham. Take on Burnley. Um, last season, would you think it's fair to say that Tottenham's last season was, was an abject failure? Awful. Right. Disastrous. So they got 60 points, right? Yeah. Finished at eight. They were lucky to. Yeah. How many points have they got this season? Great question. 60. So 60 got... points, right? Four defeats on the bounce, conceding 3.25 per game, 19th in the form table over the last five games. And what about the six game form table? You know, you're not going to flip this on his head and go, oh, well, they should stick with Pochettino, give him time. <laughs> you're going to say, Poster Coglu does not deserve time, aren't you? No, I'm just, a, I'm just a little bit concerned for everyone that loves Ange. And I don't know where you are on the Ange loveometer, um, but I'm just a little bit worried because it does look a little bit like they've been right royally figured out. Is that is that fair or not? Yeah, I think there's lots of things to, to love about him. I think there's elements about him that that need to be sorted like the the, pra the, the, the there needs to be some pragmatism right and he he sets his whole stall out by being like the arch idealist right this is the way we play mate and i have you know i have a degree of sympathy for that approach because you do as a manager you do have to be you know uncompromising on your approach but i do think that, the, that you can do that whilst having a, a level of pragmatism where you fix things that aren't fundamental to your your ideals, but are fundamental to giving yourself the best chance for those ideals to work. Set pieces. It's unconscionable for a manager to say there's not an issue with set piece conceding from set pieces if you're getting into games and conceding set pieces and it's affecting your ability to win games. There's nothing about the ideals of what he's doing that Hold means on, that you John. can't do that. You just said you were pro Ange. I am pro Ange. You sound very anti Ange. No, I'm, I, I like to feel as though you can be pro a manager and, and recognise their weaknesses. I think I feel as though I've done that with Andoni Areola. Who uh, I would like to oh. I would like to point out is today the recipient of a Premier League Manager of the Year nomination. You have been on his side and espousing his qualities mm. for quite some time. But does that mean I think that he should suddenly start I don't know coaching Man United? No, because I think there are questions about his tactical approach. So with Ange, it's the same. I I like a lot of the things that he does, but when you're coaching at the very highest level for an elite team, you have to have an ability to tweak the things to put everything in your favor for your system to work as well. So uh, I think the question for me is like how willing he's going to be over the summer to make those tweaks. I think that the team will be improved by bringing in better players in the squad to be able to play that way. But I also think the team will be improved by making tactical decisions, which aren't fundamental to his idealistic approach, but have to be made in order to, to be able to give himself the, the best op uh, opportunity to succeed. 
I mean, he needs he needs the players. You can't have Ben Davis and Emerson Royale trying to play his inverted fullbacks. It's ridiculous. But that's how he's what to, that's what he's had to do for a, a large amount of the season. Um, what what I worry about with Spurs is that he, they need a big overhaul this summer, and they need to get players out to get them in because there's a lot of fat yeah. in that squad that needs trimming. But that's not how Spurs do things. Well, we'll see what happens mm. uh, when they take on Burnley if they were to lose that at home. Whew. All the very best. Yeah. Um, yeah. Tim, thank you very much for your presence. Cheers. Thank you. You gave you presents? I didn't yeah. get any. No, <laughs> no. Well, you didn't bring anything either. Oh, well. Thanks, John. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks very much <laughs> for uh, for being here once again. <laughs> I am is going to be back on Monday with the next episode of the Athletic FC podcast. All that's left for me to say is have a wonderful weekend, everyone. Thanks for listening and thanks for watching on YouTube as well. If you want to watch more episodes of the show, please subscribe to the channel. We'll be joined by the likes of David Ornstein, Matt Slater, Adam Crafton, Carl Anker, and plenty more through the season. If you'd like to listen to the episodes in full in audio form, search The Athletic FC wherever you get your podcasts from.